Friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to Planet IMEX and to what has to be one of the most intriguing sessions that you're going to find available in the general educational program. Let me ask you about what you think about stories. We all know about the power of stories to move us emotionally, to change our behavior and experience. Any advertising person knows they're very, very powerful, but they're powerful in different ways too. And the company that's bringing you this session knows exactly that. Before I introduce the speakers who are going to be delivering today's content, I've promised them to get you curious and engaged. There really is no point, everybody, enjoying this session if you've got distractions. We need you engaged with the speakers, engaged with the content, with us. You can't be here physically, but we need you here emotionally. We want you to really engage. I'm not gonna to say too much about this session. We have a short video to play before, I, before we introduce you or you'll meet the presenters, but I do want to give them a shout out and tell you a little bit more about them. You'll be meeting Robert X. Fogarty, R.X. Fogarty. He's the founder of this storytelling project called Dear World. And assisting him, you'll hear from David Broadus, your familiar face to many of you. He's the database manager at IMEX, also, also an occasional writer and speaker. They'll work together. I'll leave you to see it in action. It's a fantastic, fantastic uh, experience. It's going to be something that hopefully you will hear an awesome story, but I hope also, and I'm sure Robert and David do too, that you'll discover one of your own. We have a short video to introduce Dear World a little bit in more detail, and then the next person you'll hear from is Robert. He'll be all yours, and he'll introduce David uh, when the time is right. Please, let's play the video. See you in a short while. Take it. When I was 26, a man sent butterflies down my spine and into my stomach. The night that changed my life happened unexpectedly. I was in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina and I was photographing people and asking them why they loved it so much. They would honor that by writing a little message on their skin about their city. But then one night, a man asked me to do something different and I said, sure. And then he came back into my frame and his wife uncovered his bare chest revealing the words cancer free. It was that night that I realized the ingredients of a marker, a camera, and a short, meaningful message was nothing short of magical. And since then, we've heard accounts from Zero World participants about babies' first words and grandparents' last, mentors' life-changing advice, and heroes' life-saving decisions. We've heard inside jokes that'll make your cheeks hurt, and tales of midnight capers that ended in lifelong groundings. We've heard stories of people confronting their biggest fears or celebrating their team's incredible wins. And sometimes when people ask us, is my story worth sharing? We respond, everyone has a story worth sharing. If it has meaning to you, it has meaning to us. Well, welcome everyone to this incredible session. I just want to shout out John. Thank you for getting us going uh, on a great start here. It is so incredible to see people from around the world on this session. I also love that you came to hear an awesome story. We certainly have an incredible story in store for you. Um, just for our learning outcomes, I wanna go over our agenda today with you. Um, the agenda today uh, will be pretty simple. Um, you're gonna hear a meaningful story uh, that David Brodus has been working on in the Dear World style. Um, we're also going to reflect on our storytelling method that we've been developing over the last 10 years. So um, I want y'all to get a little feel for what David went through. So we're gonna uh, reflect on some of the most important values uh, in your life. And then finally, we will discover some tricks, 
some tips uh, for meaningful online sessions as they relate to stories. And uh, David and I are going to have a discussion about uh, why stories matter. You'll notice also we are going to be using heavily uh, the Slido functionality uh, through this session. So uh, that is our goals for the day. We are really, really excited. And uh, just thank you for your time, your energy, and your effort in this session. I will say, uh, if you do have a phone or a piece of paper and a pencil, you're going to need it. Um, a little bit later on. So your notes function on your phone or a pen and a piece of paper, uh, and then we'll get going. But before we get into David's story, um, we've been doing this work for 10 years, and I just wanted to share with you one story uh, that we, uh, uh, at Dear World, that is I'm very proud of, and it's Mina Justice. Uh, Mina Justice was part of our Orlando Pulse nightclub series campaign. And if you ask me to justice why she wrote, I went to the bedroom and he wasn't there. She'll launch right into a story about uh, the day after uh, the Orlando Pulse nightclub shooting. She um, um, had already been told by the FBI here in the United States that her son Eddie was in the club that night and that he uh, hadn't, uh, hadn't survived. But she held out hope. She went into his apartment and then into his bedroom, uh, hoping that it wasn't true. And uh, this is one of uh, an incredible story from Dear World. We have 150,000 stories, but they're all typically centered around seminal moments in our lives. So the moment that she went into the bedroom and saw that Eddie wasn't there, uh, we call these brain tattoos. These can be massive moments in our lives, or little moments, Um, and we're going to take you through a little bit of our storytelling process um, a little bit later, but I wanted to share with you just one piece of work um, from our body of work uh, going forward. Now, um, our first goal here is to uh, strap in and to listen to a finished Dear World story. Um, I've been working with David Brodus for about a month now on uh, his story. We are going to turn the time over to him. He's been working on this meaningful story. We're going to listen to David, and then we're going to get into some of your work and your stories. But uh, without further ado, we figured let's get right to it, and let's his- let's hear an awesome story. So, David Brodus, over to you. Hi, Robert. Thank you so much for that. It's been really great working with you uh, on um, putting together the story. Usually when a person writes, they write in a bubble, um, but you've been a great mirror to me um, in getting this put together, so thank you. Um, So over the last five years, my husband and I have taken in 41 homeless kids who we look after until they can get on their feet again. Now, I should make clear, we don't take in 41 at once, one at a time, which is uh, more than enough, really. They come to us through a charity called Night Stop. And if they don't seem too violent or otherwise liable to murder us in our beds, Night Stop sends them our way. Most of what I do entails washing socks and underwear, cooking meals that teenagers actually will seem to eat, and once in a while listening if they feel like talking. I can talk to these kids about a lot of the things they're going through because I've been there myself. I've never actually been homeless, but I have struggled. And I know what it feels like when it feels like your life is spinning out of control. I make them laugh a lot of the time about my stories. I tell them all the stupid things I've done and the mistakes I've made. Because if I just sat them down and told them that everything was going to be okay, I'd just be another stranger trying to make them feel better. So instead, I show them what a disaster I was, and now I'm okay. And I think that's something that they can relate to. It's always interesting because we never know who's going to come through the door. There was this great bear of a boy who had been sleeping in a park, setting up camp on the highest hill. Taking his inspiration from ancient armies, he decided it was the best vantage point for spotting the approach of his enemies. 
When he said goodbye every morning, he would crush us in his beer hugs and tell us we were honorable men. And then there was the cheeky lad who made fun of all my food, made us watch all of his television programs, and lamented the fact that he had gotten to the charity so late in the day that by that time all the good families were gone. So I got you. They've basically all been really good kids. But I'd be lying if I said it was always easy. Our very first kid had woken up next to his best friend who had OD'd and died during the night. We've had autistic kids and trans kids and a girl who was escaping an arranged marriage. And some had stories which I never knew, uh, who just wanted to be left alone and with their own thoughts. There have been many nights when my funny stories couldn't help, where I struggled to find the right words to say to make things seem better. That's when it's really tough. But it's not as tough as being 16 and having to knock on a stranger's door and ask for a bed for the night. That's real bravery. So when Night Stop calls, I pick up the phone. There are a lot of reasons why I do this. There's something pretty wonderful about going to bed at night, knowing that there's a kid in my spare room who's clean and safe, who otherwise may not be. And that's a really great thing. But aside from that, I'm also repaying a debt. When I was in my early 20s, I was living in LA. Things were so tight that I essentially had to choose between food and rent. There was money for one, but not both. And I only weighed about 100 pounds at the time. So I think if I ate any less, I would actually just disappear. Two women who lived down the hall a mother and daughter, who were both called Margot, took pity on the scarecrow next door and did something that I found extraordinary. I came home from work one day to find bags of groceries at my door, rice and beans and spaghetti, things that were cheap but that would fill you up because they didn't have a lot of money either. In the note attached, it just said, please do this for someone else one day. So here I am. People often wonder about what we do as if it were some extraordinary gesture, but compassion shouldn't be extraordinary. It should be as common and simple as washing socks or telling someone they're gonna be okay. David, wow. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you feel? Um, uh, energized and relieved. <laughs> I was, I was right there with you. I was like, you were taking us on such a journey, and um, I really appreciate you for doing that and working really hard on your story. We're going to be, uh, you and I are going to be breaking down your story a little bit later, but I want to see uh, uh, what our audience thinks of your story. And uh, John, if we could go to our first poll um, or word cloud and uh, everyone out there uh, on the, uh, the call, just one word or uh, words, uh, what words come to mind after hearing David's story? No right or wrong answers here. Um, and we'll start reading them out as, as they come in. So what word or words come to mind for you? No right or wrong answers. Wow, David, they're coming in. Empathy, compassion, inspirational, gratitude, tears, emotion, selfless, safe, safe, visceral. What a beautiful word. Let's keep up. Uh, let's go another 20 seconds here out, in the, out on uh, uh, our attendees. Awesome work. Humbled, humbling, miracle. Wow, David. That's nice. Miracle, David. Miracle, brother. This oh, I don't is know compassion. about that. But I like compassion. Safe. Safe I like safe, safe too. I like humanity. Um, really, I think um, 
And everyone out there, thank you so much. We're going to be using Slido throughout this. This was, you're off to a great start. Thank you for being engaged. You're going to be continued to be engaged, especially when we break down a little bit about David's work here. Um, and then we're going to get into your own, uh, a little bit of your story. So thank you all so much. David, I'm curious to, to hear from you. Um, we took you through the brain ta tattoo method that we've developed. We've been working uh, for uh, a few weeks on this, and we're going to take the rest of our audience through a little bit of it as well. But um, can you just relate back to your very first list, uh, and what did you have on there just for the audience? Maybe three or five things in that very general uh, opening step. I had some things like friends and books, uh, but I also had kindness and compassion and resilience. Um, awesome. Compassion and resilience. And uh, towards the end here, we settled uh, on a story of compassion, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, which had a little bit of resilience in it as well. Um, yeah. Both in my past and in, in the present of the, of the kids in the story. David, we're going to get right back to you, um, and we'll be breaking down your story further, but um, we're going to get into the audience's stories a little bit, and, and um, for the audience viewing at home, you can do this on your notes, or you can do this on a pen and paper. We'll be using Slido. Of course, you don't need to share anything you don't want to share, but uh, we're going to get into a little bit of your story. So, um, uh, the brain tattoo method, the, the work we've been doing with CEOs to national champion athletes to Syrian refugees uh, is a three-step process. We're just going to take you through about the first step and a half because we don't have the full amount of time, but uh, let's rock and roll here. Um, I want you to get out a piece of paper and a pen, or you can do it on your notes, and I'd like to share with you the first step of my list for Planet IMAX. Um, and if you'll notice on my list, we start with reflecting on our life. Um, how many more days do we have was something I wanted to write down. Uh, resilience was a big thing on my list. Uh, brighter days. Um, parents are amazing. My best friend's uh, son just turned three. Um, so I'm going to uh, turn on about three minutes of music here. And we're just going to give each of you time to write a list of the things that are valuable or meaningful in your life. Literally, anything can be on your list. It can be your values, your hopes, your dreams, people you love. But for three minutes, um, we're going to put on some music. And I want you to go ahead and work on your list. So we'll see you in three minutes. Back. 
Uh, we're going to go to Slido now. And I just want you to share out three to five things you wrote on your list. And we'll start uh, reading them out. So you'll notice here, if you had joy on your list, go ahead and put it in. And then you can keep adding things on your list. Let's see some of those things coming in from your list. Beautiful independence, kids, grandchildren, determined, Alzheimer's. I love this one, Finn. Where did Finn go? Funny story, Finn is the name of my, uh, my best friend's three-year-old. Let's keep them coming, y'all. Yep, laughter, love. New beginnings, spiritual connection. Yeah, keep them coming, y'all. These are great. Helping others, positivity, self-worth. I love the puppies, Maxwell and Stell. All right. Sayer of yes. Sanity. These are so good, y'all. Keep them coming, and we're going to get moving on here. Again, out there in the world, um, our method is not about all the things you wrote on your list. We call it the brain tattoo method, and we're going to be moving you just to one more step into that. Um, I want you to think of one word you circled on your list. And just circle one of the words. Um, you can mentally circle it uh, if it's just on your notes um, or if you actually do have paper, but let everything else go. Um, I circled resilience. I circled resilience. Um, David in step one circled compassion. Um, so you go ahead and circle what uh, you want to work on in your next step, which is the brain tattoo step. Cool. So um, we're going to spend a few more minutes here. Um, and all I want you to do on this step is to uh, uh, come up with a, a moment in your life that is salient. Um, it doesn't have to be a big moment like Mina Justice's. Um, it can be a small moment as well around the idea that you circled in the first step here. So for me, resilience. And I uh, love on um, brain tattoos to just start the time I or when I. So try and be as specific as possible here about the brain tattoo. Um, so for me, with resilience, um, when I lost 30 pounds, um, when I lost 30 pounds, that was my brain tattoo. So um, we're going to have y'all uh, come up with a moment, a specific memory, and we'll go to Slido for those as well. And so try using the time I or when I uh, for your brain tattoo. All you have to do is um, write in the time I blank or when I blank. We'll start reading them out and we'll give everyone some time here. But the folks who already know exactly a brain tattoo, go ahead and start chatting it in and we'll start reading them out. Awesome work, everyone. We'll just start reading them out as they come in. <laughs> the time I moved to D.C. just before a pandemic. Ooh, the time I adopted my daughters when I fought back, when I lost my mom. When I decided being childless didn't make me worthless as a woman. When my son asked me if he could be anything he wants to be. The time I got married in front of my IMAX family. I want to hear that story. The time I finished my first triathlon at 48. When Finn falls asleep holding my hand. The time I stopped giving a shit. I love that. Keep them coming, y'all. These are beautiful, um, salient moments in your lives about what you circled in step one. When I survived... I'm a sayer of yes. Beautiful work, y'all. We'll wait a few more minutes to keep these coming in. 
when I realize other people's opinion of me don't define me. Beautiful work here, y'all. When I lived in New Orleans, I love that one. 504, who dat? Wow, these are so good. The time I fostered many kittens for the animal shelter with my daughters. When I realized being adopted meant love and not wanted. Wow. I'm coming, y'all. These are beautiful. My first and only half marathon at 45. Awesome work, y'all. Keep them coming. When I became cancer-free, I can do anything. John, let's go to our next. I think we have some awesome brain tattoos. We'd love to go to our next Slido question. And as best you can, um, I would love you to slot where your brain tattoo falls into thematically. Um, if it doesn't fall into any of these, you can circle, uh, uh, click other. But go ahead and let us know where these kind of fell under for you. Um, and try and just pick one. Results are coming in. Resilience is in the early lead. Resilience is still the winner. Family, love, overcoming fear, grace and forgiveness. The results are coming in. Awesome work here, y'all. Family coming in second place right now. Beautiful work here, y'all. This is so cool. Often stories have obstacles. I think that's why resilience is such an important part of storytelling uh, in our lives is that uh, uh, the best stories don't follow a straight line. They often uh, have ups and downs and resolutions, but you can't have a resolution without an obstacle that's often overcoming a challenge, often what we call resilience. So great work here, y'all. Thank you so much. Um, we, uh, we have um, about 10 more minutes, and I'd like to bring David back. And I would love to just uh, spend our last 10 minutes honoring you, David, and uh, listening to you about your process and why you think stories are important from your point, point of view. And to our uh, uh, audience, thank you for sharing uh, your brain tattoos and your themes. Uh, those were awesome to read. But, but David, my, my first question to you is when you went through this process, what were some of the brain tattoos that you came up with before you settled on um, uh, the story uh, uh, that you told? Um, resilience um, was up there um, very highly. Compassion, kindness, values um, was um, something that I was thinking about a lot. Um, and and yeah and david mm -hmm. I, i'm curious you know you went through many drafts mm -hmm. um you, you went through a lot of work can you explain your process um to the to the audience who might be curious um it looked like you weren't reading a script um it looked like you were sharing that uh from the heart but also you knew where you were taking the audience can you just mm -hmm. give us a, a little bit of insight into how you prepared for that um I did go through a few different drafts and, and, and a few different ways of saying what I, what I wanted to say. And I guess at, at the end of the day, it was whittling things down to what was most important to me and what I most wanted to get across. Um, it, was, it was important to me that people got a good idea of what these kids were like you know and i think stories 
can be teachable moments um, and can 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 have the ability to change people's minds about things. Um, another topic I, I, I talk about sometimes is what it was like uh, living during the AIDS crisis and in San Francisco when all of my friends were dying around me. And I think things like that are important to keep alive, that people's experiences are important to keep alive. Um, and the experience that I have working with these kids, what I, uh, um, I thought was important to share. But it all boiled down to what were the most important things about this journey that, that I've taken um, that I wanted to share with the audience and focusing in on that. Yeah, David, and thank you. It was a masterful job. Um, I'd like to go a little bit deeper in how you positioned the story of this act of service, the seemingly extraordinary act that you do for these kids, but how you also let the audience in on a little bit of why. Why did you pick the story of it being in LA and the woman who, who bought you groceries? And can you remind the audience of what she wrote on the note that felt very brain tattoo, it felt very specific. Can you, so can you just take us back to that part of the story and uh, tell us why you uh, put it in there and why you held it towards the end? So does that make sense? So uh, mm -hmm. give us a little backstory, or you know, take us back to that and then tell us why you put it where you put it. Um, it really is true that when this opportunity um, to take in homeless kids presented itself, I, my mind went back to Margot and Margot. And I've always remembered their names, and I have a terrible memory uh, for most things, but uh, I always remember their names. It was a very meaningful thing to happen to me, uh, the kindness that, that they showed me. So when I started drafting the story, it was only natural that they be a part of it uh, because they actually are a part of, uh, of the story. And I may, you know, on the particular day that someone gave me a flyer about the charity and whatnot, if my mind hadn't gone there and I hadn't remembered what they wrote to me, which was, please uh, do this for someone else one day. That really stuck in my mind. And I thought, what am I doing with my life right at the moment that I am honoring that? Um, and it was a way for me to honor that and to honor them. And it's interesting you said, why did I put it at the end of the story? Because when I was working on this um, draft, it wasn't always at the end of the story. It was more at the beginning of the story. Um, but as I started refining it, I thought to myself, they are what this all comes back to. Um, so they are the bottom line uh, of the story itself. Um, so the appropriate place for them to go would be in the conclusion. David, it was really beautiful. And for our audience, uh, David worked so hard on this. Um, I'd offer that Margot and Margot played um, a fairy godmother character is what we'd call them if we were building out other people's stories. So um, I, when we talk about tips and tricks to be, become um, a better storyteller, better is the wrong word, but if you want to be more adept at, at, at sharing stories, a few things must be true. Um, all stories have characters. Uh, all stories have obstacles and all stories have uh, resolution. So um, um, when you get deeper into the work, uh, the use of a fairy godmother character, which is, which is someone in your life who gave you an unexpected gift, it often uh, helps people uh, align to uh, macro ideas like a story of compassion and gives uh, sheds light into the audience of why uh, people do the things they do. So, David, I thought you did an incredible job there um, by holding it to the end. Mm -hmm. um, it felt very natural to, to honor Margot and Margot and the gifts they gave you. So, thank you uh, for that. We have um, just about six minutes left. We have 
um, I think a, an awesome question for the group here, and it's uh, who is the best storyteller you know and why? Um, I'm always looking out for uh, uh, awesome things, and if it, it happens to be your, your uncle and I can find him down at the, uh, the corner saloon in some, some city, um, please write that. It doesn't need to be someone famous, but would love to hear uh, who is the best storyteller you know and, and why is that. Uh, and then we're going to turn it back over to John to close this out. So one more poll, best storyteller you know and why. David, <laughs> Obama, my mom, David, no lie, his stories gets me every time. My 99-year-old dad, Sue Monk kid, my mom, she gives details and the climax is perfect every time. David Brodus, you're just running away with this one, David. Awesome, Malcolm Gladwell, yep, I love Malcolm. My husband makes it bigger than life, suits the audience, always fun. My daughters, my dad, Walt Disney. These are awesome. Best story storyteller you know and why, David Attenborough, yep, awesome. Father-in-law, um, and why, and why, y'all. The detail my grandpa can recall, my late grandfather, he was a flight attendant, would go to all these places he told me about and knew every detail. My nine-year-old neighbor with a long memory, Bozoma St. John. Okay, I'm gonna have to look that person up. Awesome work, we'll have a few more here and then I'm gonna turn it over to John to close us out. The Obamas are getting both, all right, my father. These are awesome. I'm gonna look up some of these for sure. And with that, I just want to say thank you to um, our audience for participating, uh, to David for the work you put in, and uh, over to you, John. So we'll have you close it out. Robert, thank you very much indeed. Perfect time, and we've got just a couple of minutes. And there's a few questions coming in, and you won't be surprised to know you've 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 tantalised people, Robert, because right at the beginning you mentioned there wasn't quite enough time to do the whole process, and a few people are asking about the third step and obviously we can't do it now but but in terms of people who want to continue um and i was gonna say complete the journey that probably is a journey that probably doesn't ever finish does it but what can they do through dear world to continue the process they've just started absolutely um and you guys just got a little taste of the method the third step is crafting your dear world message. So if uh, I'll recall Mina Justice who wrote on her chest, I went to the bedroom and he wasn't there. Um, it's coming up, now you've picked a, uh, your value in step one. We usually come up with three to five brain tattoos um, to give people some time and some space. You pick a brain tattoo, you build out this, this story in an expository side, and then you write something that would evoke curiosity in others. Um, I would offer for David, if he were to write uh, it on his hand and take a picture, something like I, um, uh, the note she left me uh, said, the note she left me said, just do this for others. Um, now I can imagine David having a beautiful portrait. So the next uh, step is just to go through the brain tattoo and really get all the details out. And then think of your, your lead that would beg curiosity in others. So that's, that's the, the process. We do it all around the world with executive teams and, and groups. But uh, it was really fun to show you a little bit of it here. Well, I suppose to finish it off, we should just ask you, where can people go then? Give, us, give yourself a plug. Um, where can people go to get more information about bringing you guys in to complete this process with businesses, with their staff, or indeed individuals? Absolutely. Let's plug it up. Um, dearworld.com is our main homepage for all of our online and virtual sessions, which we're, which we're doing uh, digital.dearworld.com. They're awesome. Uh, they're great experiences. They can be from 60 minutes to three days, and we're doing a lot of them. So thank you, John, and thank you to Planet IMAX for having us. David, awesome work. Well, it leaves me just to say to Robert, to David, thank you very much for sharing um, both the process and, David, your story with us. And to everyone watching, wherever you are in the world, that's some real food for thoughts, no matter where you are. And uh, yes, this is the last session. If you're watching live, 
Um, we're going to finish up playing Planet IMAX until tomorrow. So have a restful evening wherever you are. We'll be back tomorrow for some more amazing content. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.